case studies are a clinical application of concepts we learn in physiology. You see what's wrong with the patient, you see how they present, you make the connections of their symptoms and what's really going on at the cell level. And then you take something that you've learned and you see how um, you can treat this patient. So uh, this case study is titled The Entire Swimmer. I'll just read it. Annie is on a college swimming scholarship. Recently, she had been feeling tired uh, and her times have been getting slower. She has also noticed that her vision is often blurred. Concerned, she goes to see her doctor over the midterm break and is referred to a neurologist who finds that Annie is suffering from something more than just fatigue. This case study takes students through a series of stages that describe Annie's problems and symptoms. Students use their knowledge of nerve and muscle physiology to fit the pieces together and determine what is wrong with Annie. Okay, so we got blurred vision, fatigue, she's an athlete, but she's kind of slowing down. Okay, what's going on? This could happen to anybody. Uh, okay, so we'll get back to that. The under, underpinnings of uh, this case study. What we learned um, last time was the events of how the presynaptic cell stimulates the postsynaptic cell at the neuromuscular junction. That's the first picture on the left. Let me get my pointer here. So I wanted to teach you the events here um, last time. But what I really didn't teach you is how the signal spreads from this one location, from this one synapse, throughout the whole muscle fiber. So I got to kind of mention that. I did mention, however, uh, the T-tubule system in the skeletal muscle that allows the nerve impulse to spread and calcium to kind of saturate the sarcomere structure. But we're going to talk about the details of this picture here in the topic called cross-bridge uh, cycling. This is really how muscle works, this last frame here. These two frames are just leading up to this last frame. Because once you get to here, the muscle can begin to generate tension. And once you understand how muscles begin to generate tension, then we can start talking about the lab I want you to do. That's an online simulation, and I'll present that today. Um, all right, so let me skip over the slides I've already presented. I went through these steps, right? Uh, just, just a quick review. What are those little green balls represent? ACH. Do you remember the name of its receptor? We just called it ACHR. Uh, remember the name of the enzyme that breaks down ACH? ACHE. Okay, those are all in your notes. You should review those. And uh, I'm not quizzing you this morning, but I am quizzing you at the end of today, right? You got a lab quiz, right? Okay, so what I taught was how you get an influx of sodium and how it spreads throughout the surface of the cell. I did not talk about these channels. These channels here, if you look carefully, these are called voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. They're different from these channels here. Right, so. Voltage-gated sodium potassium channels. The reason why we need to discuss them is, well, they're going to allow um, <coughs> the action potential or the depolarization to spread across the surface of the whole muscle fiber. Because the neuromuscular junction, just to go back one frame, it's only one small part of the muscle fiber. That signal has to spread. But this little jolt of sodium influx is not enough to spread poop out really quick. Okay, You need other channels to keep the action potential traveling in all directions across the surface. So that's why we need to talk about these channels. Okay, Once this little jolt of sodium influx gets in, it's enough to activate other channels to keep more positive charge flowing in. 
so that the whole cell becomes depolarized and stimulated. So these voltage-gated ones are very uh, important. I'll say keep action potential spreading across the entire muscle fiber. Then you got a, a sodium, a voltage gated sodium channel, and a voltage gated uh, potassium channel. And they're embedded in the cell membrane. It's a narrow phys term that means it's electricity. It's the potential difference across, um, in this case, the cell membrane, the membrane potential. It's not at equilibrium. There's definitely some potential here. The inside is all negative, but the outside is all positive. Okay, we talked about this before. We had charge separation. What you have to understand is why they're voltage gated. Uh, what opens the gate is a change in voltage. Okay, so these are the gates. Sodium is um, doubly gated. There's two gates. This little ball and chain gate, which is open, but this gate's closed right now. They call this the activation gate. And we'll talk about these again in the neural phys chapter. But they, these are all protein structures, the sodium and the potassium. And protein structures are just made of amino acids, which carry um, charge with them. So imagine, don't imagine this is what it really is, Okay, in this part of the gate, notice how the gate is closed here. In this part of the gate, there's a little bit of positive charge. I guess the same thing here, too. That bit of positive charge, it's like it's attracted to the negative charge right there. And it's re repulsed by the positive charge on the outside of the membrane. So that keeps the gate closed. It's a gated closed. So what changes, what opens the gate is a change in voltage. So again, to jump back to the previous slide, if you stimulate at the neuromuscular junction and you have an influx of sodium, that little bit of positive charge, it, it looks to the next area of membrane and it sees that it's negative and there's current that'll flow positive and it'll replace all the negative charges there and it'll have negative charges on the outside and positive charges on the inside. So you're going to flip it. You're going to change the voltage. So, you know, this wave of sodium influx comes in from the neuromuscular junction, and it looks to here and says, oh, I'm attracted to that, right? Positive, negative, and you have current from 
these ions flowing to here, this all flips. Same thing will happen to potassium too. The gates will swing open. Uh, so that's why they're, they're, they're voltage gated. And so basically what you should know is that these open at the same time. However, the kinetics of these are very uh, different. Potassium channels are very slow to open and close. These are very fast to open and close, so the kinetics are different. I'll just say fast, and I'll just say slow. They both react to the same thing, a change in voltage. However, these just open and close fast, these open and close slow. I always give the analogy like, if I race Usain Bolt in the 100 meters, and the gun goes off. Well, we start at the same time, but who's going to finish first? Him, by a long shot. Okay. So, you know, we, we, they both react to the same way. But these, this, this guy's like Usain Bolt. He just opens and closes really fast. And this just reacts more slowly. But they both start at the same time, right? Um, well, anyways. Is that because you need more sodium than potassium? No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that kind of gets me to this picture here. The kinetic is such that you do want a punch of sodium um, faster, but then you want to depolarize, but then you want to repolarize. Okay, so that's why you kind of need both. Um, so you depolarize first, that's the fast one, then you repolarize second. The other thing I should mention is, I don't know if you remember this from the previous lecture, the cell works hard at making uh, the concentration gradient so that there's more sodium on the outside. And the concentration gradient for potassium is such that there's more potassium on the inside. So the next thing to think about is when the gate opens due to a change in voltage, which way will sodium go, in or out? In. You'll have sodium influx, and we call that, you know, the, the depolarization. Okay. Anyway, so. so membrane potential. What you really see in the lab is you just measure voltage in millivolts, okay, over time. Negative 70. In the state of rest, basically, you're at a negative membrane potential. But if you stimulate and measure at this part of the membrane, what you'll notice is when you get that sodium influx, it'll kind of like fall to zero. The sodium influx is so powerful, you'll even overshoot zero and go past it. This represents the sodium influx. Okay. So I'll use the I'll use red. And we call that the depolarization. I'll just say depol for short. Or you, well, okay, you say, oh, if the cell is becoming more positive with respect to the inside because of the sodium influx, because these open fast, but then they inactivate really fast. What happens is this ball and chain gate, it'll plug it up really fast. So they'll inactivate. And what happens is to help you to repolarize, these slowly open and then allow for the potassium efflux. So that'll allow you to repolarize 
back to rest. So the repolarization um, is due to the potassium efflux. So I'll say that again. The depolarization due to sodium <coughs> influx and the repolarization is due to potassium influx. So that's everything you're supposed to be seeing from um, this picture here. On the picture, they show the sodium influx, the yellow balls coming in. Okay, So that's why I point to this side, where the membrane potential is increasing. A spike has two sides, the side that rises and the side that falls. Uh, so this one, they, they show the potassium efflux. Okay? You're letting the positive charge leave, and that allows you to repolarize back to rest. That's why I kind of put the arrow on this side. This picture they show this gate is open. However, they show this gate's closed. That little ball and chain plugged it up. So those are the voltage gated sodium and potassium channels. Not to be confused with what we talked about last time. One last time to go back to this slide. What did we categorize the kind of cell that opens when it binds ACH. We didn't call it voltage gated. We call it we called it ligand gated. It opens not because of this change in voltage, but because it binds its ligand ACH. And that allowed the influx of sodium. Okay, I mean, that's where this came from in the first place, uh, at the neuromuscular junction. And then it kind of spreads and triggers other uh, voltage-gated channels to open. So don't confuse the, the ligand-gated with these two, the voltage gate. So you know, there's a lot of chemicals that we, we, we talk about and when we talk about cell physiology, for example, we, we have to start looking at this. The way they organize the pathogens, is they put muscle before nerves. I think this is best understood when you teach uh, the neuron. Uh, but that's like chapter 11, I think. So it's coming, but I have to mention it now. Uh, just know for now, depolarization is due to sodium influx. Depolarization is to potassium efflux. So, biochemical review. This whole thing was triggered with ACH. <coughs> Think of ACH as just a trigger, okay? It's the trigger at the neuromuscular junction. Does ACH actually ever enter the muscle fiber? That's a yes, no question. No. no. It binds its receptor, but it never actually enters the cell. It's sodium that enters. So think of ACH as a trigger to stimulate the muscle fiber. Uh, sodium influx at the motor end plate polarizes it. This, this is essentially the action potential, that spike, right? The action potential of the polarization. Think of ACHE as a switch off, because as long as ACH is there, you'll get sodium in influx and the muscle will just keep on contracting. Now what we have to talk about is the importance of calcium. Calcium is released from SR, that stands for sarcoplasmic reticulum, and um, it directly causes the cross bridge formation, so we'll get into that next. So I'm gonna clear the board. There's no questions on the voltage gated. I'm gonna move on here.
So back to the case study. And uh, I forgot to put out the little half sheets. As you get your half sheet and return to your seat, um, well, t take a look at this. We'll, we'll start to read about the case study again. Okay, so my staying at Gravis is actually the diagnosis of the case study, causing the swimmers slower time to fatigue, the blurred vision. Um, it affects about one in every 20,000 persons caused by muscle paralysis fatigue. And pathologically, what's happening is an autoimmune disorder. Normally, your own antibodies are only supposed to attack like non-cell pathogens. But in autoimmune disorders, your own antibodies attack your cells. And um, the antibodies attack acetylcholine receptors, ACHR, right, in patients with myasthenia gravis. Therefore, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease in which patients have developed antibodies that block slash destroy their own acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction. Usually what happens is, as a mistake, antibodies bind to something that's yourself, and it's usually not supposed to do that. But in cases where maybe you have a tumor, or, um, 
it takes on the appearance of another molecule that is in your own body, like ACHR. So basically the antibodies are reacting to some tumor somewhere else in the body. Turns out those antibodies happen to fit proteins on ACHR, causing the autoimmune problem. All right, so if the disease causes paralysis of the res respiratory muscles, death can occur. So it's a very large concern. You know, the diaphragm, the breathing muscles. If those paralyzed, you can't breathe, and you can pass away. You can die. Other symptoms include a generalized fatigue, blurred double vision because of the smooth muscle in the eyeball. You'll learn about <coughs> ciliary body um, at the end of this course when we talk about the eye. So there's smooth muscle in the eye causing the blurred vision. Uh, treatment may include thymus removal. Usually a tumor in the thymus kind of triggers this. The body reacts to fighting the tumor, but that antibody that you make against the tumor happens to also attack the ACHR. So if you remove the tumor, maybe the anti antibody um, against it goes down and kind of helps you. So administration of the drug, neostigmine or some other um, anti-esterase drug can help. So what happens is, oh, you, you can read this, let me just explain it. Uh, the drug helps by sap and ACH. Okay. Let's remember what the problem here is. What is the problem? You got ACHE, you got ACH, ACHR. What does the disease, myasthenia, myasthenia gravis, what does it attack? What does it decimate? The ACHR. So imagine you have less of them. They're gone, they're gone, they're gone. And it's like, huh. Only this one works. How you treat it is, let's let this one work more, okay? And let's do it by preserving the ACH time in the synaptic cleft. And how do you do that? Well, what's gobbling it up as normal function? ACAG. So if you kind of like decimate ACAG with your drug, um, one of the drugs again, neostigmine, and you allow the ACH that's normally released to persist longer, you'll allow the fewer ACHR receptors to work better, and that can help the patient. So, on your half sheet, I want to make sure you understood what I just said. So, that it just blocks more of the ACHE? Yeah. Okay. So, on your half sheet, let's write about this. Write how Neostigmine can help patients with MG on your half sheet. I guess we'll call it number one. How does Neostigmine help patients with Myasthenia gravis, we'll just call it MG for short.
All right. I'll be interested to see what you put. Well, we're going to move on from the case study. Before I do, I, it's funny, the first year I presented this case study, I actually had a student who had it. She came to me and she shared that. And I was like, oh, wow. I wasn't expecting this. But she had the same problem. She, she was a student enrolled in DSPS here, and she needed extra time because she would have blurred vision, so it took her longer to read questions. And um, Yeah, the main thing she worried about was not being able to breathe. I mean, it's okay if your swim times go down. It's not life-threatening. But if you can't breathe, uh, they do, that's the main concern. Should have made a case study about her, but I never got her permission. But uh, she was actually, you could relate to her. She was a 4-3 student. Uh, yeah, she confirmed a lot of things that the case study presented as written. You know, I already went over these slides. I just uh, talked about the muscle fiber models and preparations for today's quiz. And before the quiz, I'll, I'll be sure to give you some lab time to review. And remember, you'll have to turn in those two worksheets today. The bone lab and the muscle fiber lab, you should have finished those by now. But this is the topic I want to get to um, so I can start to present the muscle physiology for the uh, online lab. cross-bridge cycling, and it has to do with the cross-bridge that forms between actin and myosin, and how it cycles repeatedly. So we just talked about the cycle one time. And what you should take away from this is the importance of calcium and ATP for muscle. Calcium and ATP. So keep, keep those molecules in your mind as I go through the details here. Um, so, this is basically better taught in this figure here, where the pictures are shown as a repeating cycle. So whenever you teach a cycle, you can start anywhere. It doesn't matter, because eventually you'll end up where you started. So we call this cross-bridge cycling. This is physically how muscles generate tension. <laughs> because I really want to talk about that, how muscles generate tension in experiments. But we're going to talk about the molecular biology first, right? So they're, they're showing you a lot of things in one picture. So look at everything they're showing you. First, do you see the sarcomere on the left? They show you the sarcomere. You know that. What's the line in the middle called? M line, you know, part of the H zone. Why does that kind of point in? Hmm. Oh, that's because the filaments slide inward, right? The thin filaments, they slide towards the M line. But they're just showing you one small section there. Right here, you blow it up. And it looks like they start with cross-bridge formation. That's what I call this step, cross-bridge formation. It's when the myosin head binds the active site on the active. Miles and head binds active site on active. I mean, what had to happen so that cross bridge could form? We'll just kind of talk about it. Look for the calcium red balls. You see that? Calcium red balls have bound troponin. And what happened was, when that happened, it made the troponin move the tropomyosin to expose the active site. Okay, that's what had to happen for this to occur. 
So, calcium binds <coughs> component as a result. Tropomyosin moves, therefore, you know, uncovering, exposing the active sites. I'll say exposes. So that's what had to happen previously. If we get the crossbreed. As soon as they're they're uncovered, it's like there's like it's like a magnet, you just boom, it sticks to it. But as long as they're covered, it's not it's, there's no crossbreed. As soon as you uncover them, there's nothing that has to like happen. It, it's just gonna like bind. Okay. Like a super strong magnet just gets sucked into that little uh, active site there. So basically, look at the these angles here. The mouse and head's kind of like uh, I'll just draw the mouse and head right there. It's kind of cocked like that. You know, these angles have been measured. Thankfully, we don't have to know. But what they call this is a high energy configuration for, for these angles of the mouse and head. High energy configuration. They kind of use an analogy of like a like a pistol, you cock the hammer back and it's ready to fire kind of thing. Uh, well, anyways, high energy configuration means it could do work. <laughs> if you're a boxer and you want to punch someone, but your arm is fully extended, can you, can you punch them? No. But what if you go like this? Well, I shouldn't use these violent analogies. But they basically mean at these angles, it can do a lot of work. It can pivot that way. That's what they're trying to say. And look at the ATP. The ATP has been hydrolyzed, but they haven't released it yet because they kind of have it hanging on. ADP and P. So ATP hydrolyzed, ready to do work. Okay, it's like you're you're about to release the ADP and the P. And when you release them, there's energy so that this head can kind of pivot that way. So those are all the details I would get from that picture. And let's move on. The actual physical work is this step. It's called the power stroke. Step two. You know, we never like to say there's a most important step, but this is the most important step. It's the physical work, okay? Move my muscle. Power stroke. You know, exclamation point. It's the mechanical work. You're pulling the uh, filaments past each other and you're generating tension. Look at whole muscle in the lab, it's usually grams or kilograms of force um, generating tension. So, what's happening is um, it's like you're swinging this whole thing this way, right? It's like that's the power to move from that position uh, to that position. Okay. And I, what I said last time is that active. Slides past stationary. Myosin. You're sliding towards the M line. Okay, you're shortening the sarcomere length when you do this. So look what happens to the ADP in the P. It's released. Okay. It's um ADP and the 
world possible. So we see the importance of ATP. Okay, you need it, the energy from that release to do this physical work. All right, so you've done the work. So what you got to do is you have to detach and get ready for the next cycle. And so the detachment happens when ATP <coughs> binds the mouse to the head again. So I'll call this cross bridge detachment. Step three. Just by looking at the picture, it looks like how they've illustrated it's correct. They kind of like have drawn it like you've gone from here all the way back to like there. And you've detached from the actin. So they call this low <coughs> energy configuration. Cross-bridge detachment, what is necessary for that cross-bridge to break is ATP binding. That's what causes it. ATP binding, mouse and head, causes this. So ATP is very important. Not only is ATP responsible for this detachment, ATP is also, also responsible for pumping the calcium back into the SR. Because as long as calcium's there, this cycle is going to continue to happen. Okay. ATP also needed to pump calcium. back into SR, you know, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the you know, NSACs, the terminal cistern, all that. Just pump it back in there so you can kind of have muscle relaxation. Uh, all right. So this figure focuses on ATP. There's other high energy phosphates. ATP is just one of them. Uh, there's one called, you heard of, <coughs> creatinine. Oh, I just call it CP for short. It's another high energy phosphate. Because um, if you actually like, say start sprinting or something, there's enough ATP in your muscle cells to last you a few seconds. That's not very long. So then other high energy phosphates can take over, like this one. With ATP and CP, your muscles can do work for like eight to 10 seconds. Maybe that's enough time to do a 50-yard sprint or a 100-meter sprint if you're a world-class athlete. After you deplete ATP and CP, there's other uh, energy phosphates, not energy phosphates, just energy sources for the cell, like glycogen. Uh, glycogen can last you a couple of minutes, right? Like a couple of laps around the track. And after that, um, you know, there's other energy sources like uh, fat storage you can start using. But the high energy phosphates can last you several seconds of intense muscle work. So you have to get out of this low energy configuration to get ready for the next cycle. And so what happens is they call this um, the mouse and head re-energizes. So it looks like the only thing that really changed was um, 
the head kind of cocked back, okay? So it went from like kind of being like that and it just kind of swung back a little bit. And what it did was it took that ATP and again it hydrolyzed it, but it didn't let go of it. Okay, it held on to the ADP and the P. So I'll put ADP hydrolysis. This is where we left off, so that's kind of the end of the cycle. What'll happen is it'll just form another cross bridge and it'll start over. It'll keep going and going and going. It's basically attach, pull, release, attach, pull, release, it just keeps repeating. Another way you can uh, study the cross bridges is to kind of look at a cross-sectional view of it instead of a longitudinal view of it. So what you see here, they show you the calcium being released. And when the calcium is there, they show the calcium sweeping the tropomyosin strand. It's covering the active site. When calcium is there, it sweeps it to the side. Okay. And as soon as it's uncovered, the active site, the myosin head, uh, is free to bind to it. So it's just another perspective of the same thing. And so number one is the actin, uh, the pearl. But the tropomyosin is right there. The troponin is the triple unit brown thing right there. Uh, and calcium is shown, uh, they just kind of illustrate calcium number five there. Just sweeping it to the side, just another picture to look at to help you understand it. And so this is how skeletal muscle works. It uses calcium in ATP, okay. So we're gonna look at uh, smooth muscle now. Well, for smooth muscle, which is located in um, hollow organs and the linings of structures that look like tubes, many layers of smooth muscles. For smooth muscle, you have spindle-shaped cells. They're not multinucleated. They have a solitary nuke in the middle, and they appear smooth. There's no striation. However, they do have the same contractile proteins. They just don't look striped. Instead of axon terminals, you have these little bulbous, they call them var varicosities that have neurotransmitters. And what happens is um, they have intermediate filaments that are anchored with dense bodies. We didn't see this in skeletal muscle. So that when um, contraction occurs, they just kind of twist in a way. So they look kind of spiral. So this is relaxed, this is contracted. intermediate filaments are anchored by what are called the dense bodies. The cell um, takes a, a spiral appearance kind of like a corkscrew 
when it contracts. So, the cell takes a spiral appearance during contraction. Here's bladder, which has smooth muscle in it. And to give the analogy of a, a barber, barbershop pole, <laughs> kind of looks like that. And the muscle looks kind of all squiggly and spirally under the microscope. There's something called unitary and multi-unit smooth muscle. So let's kind of distinguish that. Unitary versus multi unit. Uh, the difference is the presence or absence of gap junctions. In unitary muscle, gap, gap junctions allow the signal to spread much easier. So you get this unitary contraction. All the layers are contracting better together. Gap junctions, multi-unit, basically no gap junctions. So you, you say what you say is a um, multi-unit smooth muscle has more of a graded response. So it's like you have recruitment. If you want a little bit of a force. Just recruit some units to fire. If you want more force, hey, let's get more to fire because the signal doesn't spread very well. So you can actually recruit less or more. Here, basically, you can't. So it's all or nothing. You get the whole thing or not because of the gap junction. So they give you some examples. I think for multi-unit, the best example that you kind of see is uh, in an artery. Arteries can regulate blood pressure, and they're under sympathetic control. So sometimes you really need a strong fight or flight response to keep uh, blood pressure up, so you might want to recruit more, but you don't always need to be that stressed out, so. It's graded, okay, is what we say. You have sympathetic tone. You can either really increase the volume knob, or you can really just bring it back down. So graded responses are important in the example of maintaining blood pressure. All right, also for smooth muscle, you don't have T-tubules. You have caviola, okay, which are just little indentations. They don't go that deep. Column here for skeletal muscle. <coughs> Column here for smooth. For skeletal muscle, we said they got the T tubule. They kind of work in conjunction with the triad thing. But anyways, no T tubules in the smooth muscle. It's caviola. Little indentations, but the same purpose. Calcium enters the cell, and it triggers the release of more calcium inside the cell. Okay, these are voltage-gated calcium channels. This calcium that enters may not be enough to get the um, smooth muscle cell to contract. So it's like a little sum sum, but it triggers the release of more calcium inside the cell. That, that second burst is really enough calcium to effectively get the muscle cell to work better. So what you have here, is the physiology of smooth muscle, more differences. In skeletal muscle, calcium binds troponin. But for here, it's this molecule here. It's calcium activated calmodulin.
And what that does is that it in turn activates um, kinase activity. So the kinase activity will transfer um, the AD, ADP action to the, um, the myosin here. Okay. So that's essentially how you get to here. The filaments still slide past each other, but notice how they're doing it in different ways. In smooth muscle, excuse me, in skeletal muscle, you had the M line, and you had thick filaments, and you had the thin filaments. And it's like the thin filaments slid towards the middle. But in smooth muscle, and you got the thick filament, and then you have thin and thin. And it's, it's like the arrows are pointing. You slide this way, and slide that way. <clears throat> That's why you get that kind of spiral corkscrew appearance in the smooth muscle cell during a state of contraction, because you're sliding in opposite ways that way. The skeletal muscle is just going to shorten. That's it. For this, it's going to look spirally. So there are some differences there. Now it contracts. All right, so that's what you have to know for smooth muscle. Let's shift gears back to skeletal muscle. I'm done with these slides. Before we take a break, I'm going to start these slides. Another picture of muscles, what we think about when we see muscles. There's no muscles shown. You see the skin over the muscles. And in a well-developed person, the muscles bulge through the skin. You can even identify them through the skin. In a lab, what we do is um, whole muscle setups like this. Okay. Now, thankfully, we have the computer simulations now. When I was a grad student, I had to sacrifice a lot of frogs. Now, when you use and basically, the student would dissect out the gastrocnemius, the little femur with it, leave it attached to the femur, and the little tibial nerve gets stimulated. And um, well, we're not going to do all that. The simulations are pretty good to teach the concepts without having to sacrifice rocks. But to study a whole muscle, you need this kind of setup, whether you're studying in a simulation or on a real animal. And um, so, if you're a muscle physiologist, you want to know the extent of how muscle tissue works and how training can affect it. That's a whole other field. This is usually what students think about. There's a lot of people who are into fitness or maybe some of your athletes, the effect of athletic training. Muscles that function under no load, even if they're exercised for hours, you see little increases in strength. And usually that's desirable. We want our muscles to be strong. But if, if you don't load them, they're not going to get stronger. So for example, cardio work, you won't see increases in muscle strength, but you'll work out your heart muscle. Um, so muscles that contract at more than 50% max force of contraction will develop strength rapidly. And so in terms of training, uh, six near max reps performed in three sets per day, three days per week, uh, it's a rough general guideline for what we call resistance training. What's max? Max is what you could do one or two times. So if it's bench press, whatever you could bench press one or two times, that's your max, depending on who you talk to. Uh, for example, if 225 is your max, you could do that one or two times, that, that's your max. And if you do, if you back it off a little bit, you did 200, and do six near, six uh, reps of that, you know, three sets, three days a week, and you can see increases in strength. The 225 isn't everyone's max. That's the weight they use for the NFL combine. So how much can you bench this? And the top guys will bench it 40 times, you know. Um, but anyways, this, as a guideline, will give optimal increase in muscle strength without producing chronic muscle fatigue. With training, muscles 
hypertrophy can increase 30 to 60 percent due to increase in uh, fiber size. You're not increasing the number of muscle fibers, but maybe you're increasing the number of myofibrils in them. Okay. Muscle hypertrophy. Due to increasing fiber size, not fiber number. And also, muscle fibers, they don't undergo mitosis. I was always told as an undergrad um, when I was at Davis, he said, oh yeah, never volunteer your muscle fibers for study because once they remove them, they won't grow back. You don't, you don't get them back. Okay, so they're limited by genetics. But if you train, you can increase their size. So um, there's different kinds of contract. We mostly talk about these in this class. I'll define these after the break. But reflexive contractions have to do with skeletal muscles, but it's not voluntary. It's kind of like a knee-jerk thing. It's a reflex. But there's also what we call tonic contraction. Your muscles are always under a state of contraction. Even if you're sitting, your quadriceps still have tone. Okay. Um, basically, after you die, the cells are still alive. And as long as ATP is there, the muscle is alive. But once, several hours after death, cells start to die, then ATP goes away, and then rigor mortis sets in. Because there's nothing to break those cross bridges, right? All right, so the muscle twitch. This is where we have to start when you study a whole muscle in the lab. We, we look at figures like this. This is from your book. But where this comes from is this kind of setup. And this is kind of one of the simulations that you do. So in the lab, study the muscle twitch. What is the muscle twitch? Well, it's not normal. When you feel your muscle twitching or something, it's like, what's going on? Something's wrong. <laughs> this is not how muscles work. But in the lab, it's how we study it. Because what a muscle twitch is, a muscle twitch is a, is a single response to a single stimulus. A response to a single stimulus. In our bodies, it would be a single action potential from the axon terminal, right? And it's all computerized now, but something that's helped me understand this, I mean, you got your like, your setup here, you got your muscle all strung up. You've dissected it out of the small animal. And um, well, it's hooked up to a force transducer. The force transducer, this is like a, a piece, it's a metal blade. And it can deflect ever so slightly to assess the tension generated by the muscle when you twitch it or stimulate it. Okay, so this force transducer <coughs> transducer, it's hooked up to an amp somehow. Oh, you know, like they show. There's some stimulate button, but um, you can increase the voltage somehow. There's some kind of voltmeter. So you control the voltage and you just zap it, okay? So literally you got electrodes in there and you just zap the muscle. And every time you zap it, it's gonna twitch. So every time you hit the stimulate button, and, it's, and even in the simulation, the muscle twitches. So when the muscle twitches, it's shortening. And 
what you're going to do is you're going to measure the tension it does every time it twitches. A little, a little, a little twitch is a very quick event. So look at the time course here. It's like 100 milliseconds. It's very short. So the time is in units of milliseconds. This is grams, like tension in grams. Okay, so that means is like, let's say you had a little fish weight that weighed 12 grams, and you just put it at the end of a string. What does that feel like? That pull of a little 12 gram weight. Same thing. The muscle is generating that same kind of tension. Now, in, in the old school days, before they had computers, when they did these studies, they would literally put an ink pen. And there's an ink pen at the end, and they have chart paper, and they just hit go, and the chart paper would run, okay, right? And then they hit the stimulate button, and the twitch, when it twitched, because it's connected to an ink pen, the ink pen would like flutter, like that, okay? So imagine this ink pen with the chart paper going, and it just flutters, and what does it make? It makes that. So that's what you have to understand. It makes this muscle twitch here. When you hit stimulate, something like that. Something like that. So any questions on this setup? That's our muscle, you string it up, you hit the stimulate, you're, you're zapping it. It's outside of the body. So you can stick electrodes in there and you'll just zap it yourself. And this is kind of what it looks like. I'll show you what it looks like later on the simulation you're going to do. But anyways, let's just look at the muscle twitch. Okay, and let's kind of define all of these latent period, period of contraction, period of relaxation. And then I'll let you clear this out. muscle twitch phases. Latent period, that's the first one. Okay, so you've stimulated the muscle, but you don't see any tension. It's very short, maybe one to three milliseconds. This is the time before enough tension is generated before it registers on your graph. The latent period, that's happening yet. You've stimulated, but it's just the time it takes for tension to show. Time it takes for enough tension to be generated on the graph, the latent period. After the latent period, you have the period of contraction. period of contraction is much longer. It's the time when the tension is building and basically it goes from about here to here, so it's about uh, 15 milliseconds. Tension is building. This is where you have the maximum cross bridge cycling. <coughs> Now 
The longest period is the period of relaxation, where you go from peak tension all the way back to zero. Tension returns to zero, the muscle is in a state of relaxation, so in the cell. This is the time where you're pumping the um, calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Muscles can exist outside the animal for about four hours. Okay. Uh, kind of after that time, you can't run any more experiments. Period of relaxation. So during the time you're doing your experiments, all these things that happen in a living animal can happen after you sacrifice the animal and remove the muscle from the body. All right, so. Uh, this is our isometric prep. You can kind of like just keep it here, strung up on both ends. What you could do to make it not isometric is, instead of like having it anchored, you could put a weight on the other end. And you'll do that too. But this is an isometric prep where both ends are anchored. All right, so your physiologist or your student, you want to know how muscle works. A twitch is one response to one stimulus, but you want to know how muscle really works. One twitch doesn't tell you anything. So what you have to do is stimulate it repeatedly, okay? is like you start rubbing your hands together, you know, if you're excited about this stuff. Most students are. Right? But if you're a nerd like me, you really, let's zap it. Let's, what can this do? Let's, let's just keep, let's turn up the juice, you know, that kind of thing. That's how graduate students are when you run your experiments. Uh, but for you, just kind of telling you what, what to expect. And uh, so basically, you can stimulate it multiple times. Or you can just hit the single stimulus button repeatedly. Okay. And um, so the concept you want students to learn is, uh, what happens when you stimulate it multiple times? But also, look at the muscle length. You can vary the muscle length and see how it contracts. If you stretch the muscle out a lot, can it still contract? The answer is yes, but there is a limit. You want to find the limit. But will it be as active? Huh? Will it be as active? Yeah, the answer is uh, no, but yeah, you got to find where it kind of peaks and kind of drops off by varying the length. One thing I want to ask you now, like what if one of the things you do is, okay, let's twitch it, but let's twitch it again, let's zap it again before it has time to completely relax. All right, so um, these three questions here, I guess on your half sheet law number two. Answer this last one here on your half sheet. It's a prediction question. What would happen if you re-stimulated the muscle at 60 before it has time to relax. Answer that on your half sheet. I know it's number three on the slide, but put it number two on your half sheet. Predict what happens when you stimulate muscle before it completely relaxes. <laughs> now, of course, you can look at the next slides if you haven't printed out and kind of see, but just, just guess. There's no wrong answer here.
All right, let's move on. The next slide shows you what happens if you stimulate after the twitch is completely done. You basically get what you got before. Stimulate where I have the little triangle there and you get a twitch, completely relax, wait a little bit, stimulate again, and you get the same thing. And what they're trying to show you is if the muscle has time to relax and you re-stimulate, well, you don't get an increase in, in force. Okay. But again, you're trying to see the capabilities of muscle, so you want to stimulate sooner. So what you do Okay, that's kind of what I want to show you there. So if you still make the first time, and it, as it starts to relax, stimulate it again. What happens is you actually see an increase in strength. So this phenomenon, oh, now we generated more force. Wow, that's, you know, if you're studying muscle, oh, okay. So this, this matters, the frequency of stimulation. If you increase the frequency of stimulation, you get more force. This waveform is usually called wave summation because you're summating, you're getting more. So then if you really increase the frequency of stimulation, I mean, you might get something that looks like that. Or you get more tension, but the top, it's kind of, it's almost a straight line, but it's not quite fused. They call it unfused tetanus. So if you really max it out, Infused tetanus, you usually see um, three times the strength, three times the tension generated, as opposed to a single twitch. Three times tension generated compared to a single twitch. So that's kind of what you learn about muscle frequency of stimulation matters. So this is how muscle normally works, a nice smooth uh, generation of force. So there are the terms there. See on your half sheet, I guess we're on number three now. So go A, B, C, D, three A, B, C, D, and put the correct term with the correct waveform there, based on what we've been talking about.
I think that's enough time. What did you call A? Single twitch, correct. B? Wave summation. Then some C? Yeah, unfuse and fuse. So it's pretty much the same progression. Let's take a break. And then um, I'll continue on with this after the break. 15 minutes. See you then.